Alrighty, that was a great presentation from Karen, and now we're going to welcome Ian Stepler. He's a third generation farmer from Mantiba, Canada. His family, about 10 years ago, reconstructed the family farm to expand it into a large grain, cattle, and beekeeping operation. They crop about 3,500 acres of land, calf about 500 to 600 cattle, and manage 1,200 to 1,500 hives. Ian first got four hives 19 years ago and has dedicated his life passion towards it. Ian has learned a lot from others, which is why he likes to pay it forward and share his, shares his successes and failures. So let's welcome Ian Stepler. I'll just get my computer set up here. Just like a hunter, you never use somebody else's gun, right? <laughs> So thanks for inviting me out to Pittsburgh. Uh, it's such a beautiful area, beautiful city. Uh, driving from the airport, uh, we drove into this tunnel and a dark tunnel going through and all of a sudden we come out of the tunnel and there's this beautiful city in front of us and it's quite the perspective. And uh, excellent people here, very friendly. And I notice everybody's bitching about the cold. <laughs> <laughs> but I just want to tell you that Sandy and I left three in the morning yesterday and it was, what was it, minus 20 or something? But it was minus 40 before that school was canceled. And we're driving down the road and it's windy and it's cold and it's snowing. And, and uh, my, I think minus 40, like I talk Celsius all the time, but minus 40 is a common language between us because it means the same to me as it means to you. <laughs> um, and we both probably say the same thing when we get into minus 40 too. It's usually a four letter word. But <laughs> we uh, got to the Winnipeg airport and got in line to go through uh, uh, the security and all of a sudden this huge influx of people come behind us. There's a line up right to the back of the airport and we're thinking, yeah, well, this makes sense, you know, the, all this cold weather and everybody just wants to get out of Dodge, right? Just want to get out of here. <laughs> so we're happy to be here in Pittsburgh. And um, John is, uh, John and I have been chatting with each other for quite a while. I make these YouTube videos and so we've been in touch and he says, Ian, I want you to come out to Pittsburgh here to talk about bees. And uh, so that's what I'm here to do. I'm, I'm here, there's a lot of people that will, you know, they like to tell you how to keep bees. They want to tell you how to beekeep. And that's not really my approach. My approach is more so just to provide you guys with like perspective, right? Like the way I keep bees and the way I keep bees up in Manitoba is a lot different than you guys will down here in Pennsylvania. So, but our basics are the same as all those fundamentals, right? And if you can understand, if you can see what I'm doing and understand how I'm doing it and using these fundamentals, maybe you can bring back some of that to your own apiaries and maybe, you know, add to your overall general knowledge of beekeeping. So you'll give me a five minute warning, eh? Yeah, just throw a shoe at me because once I start beekeeping, sometimes I don't stop, just kind of like you guys. <laughs> So my name's Ian Stepler, for anybody who doesn't know, and I'm married to Sandy. Sandy's over here. Uh, we're, we have a family of five, and we're just kind of joking yesterday, sitting in the airport on Valentine's Day. It was kind of nice because it was quiet. <laughs> <laughs> I have my diploma in agriculture, and that's where I got my introduction to beekeeping. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about that uh, in one of the breakout sessions here uh, later on this afternoon. I'm a director of the Manitoba Beekeepers Association. I'm the vice president. I'm also the owner, manager, president uh, of our family farm, and I'm the farm's apiarist. So Miami, nobody really knows where Miami is. It is right down here, close to North Dakota. We're about 20 miles off the border. Miami's a little flatland community. Right, this used to be all covered in water way back when, called Lake Agassiz. So Miami is on the bottom of it. It's kind of like lake bottom, so it's as flat as a pancake. It's heavy land right down in here. Our farm is just up on top. Miami's just on the bottom of the escarpment, the shore of ancient lake, ancient lake Agassiz. So we're kind of like up in the hills. So our farm is very hilly, and you can, I'm in a combine here. You can kind of see the hills as they roll down the escarpment down to the flats around Miami. So our farm is very diverse with our landscape. 
We uh, farm 3,300 acres of grain lands. We, we look after like wheat and canola and corn and soybeans and, and uh, we grow our own silage and feed grains and such. And because of our diverse nature of our farm, um, we practice a lot of conservation practices. Primarily, we're a cattle farm. We have, uh, we're calving, this year we're calving 650 cows and we're about 400 calved out now. So it's really nice to get away from all that madness to come here, talk some bees. Um, we've been in the business for, you know, almost 50 years now. We just had a, uh, a heifer sale before Christmas where we sell select heifer stock and we're going to have a, a bull sale coming up here in March. We sell animals right across Canada uh, from BC to Nova Scotia and we sell down in the States here into Mexico. Um, we have semen rights in New Zealand, in Australia, uh, walking animals in Ukraine and Kazakhstan. So we, uh, we're pretty influential in the cattle business uh, throughout the world, I guess you can argue. For me, I, I look after the honey farm. <clears throat> we have 1,500 hives and we're primarily honey producers. We don't have any pollination uh, opportunities in our area, so we focus primarily on, pollinate, on honey production. Uh, we produce roughly 250 to 300,000 pounds of honey annually. And to get that, I hire up to local, the seven local employees from Miami to help me out, bring all that workload in. I'm a member of Bee Made Honey, which is a cooperative. It's a Western Canadian honey co-op, which we pack our own 100% Canadian honey. And uh, we supply all the, we pack, I think it's <clears throat> 25 million pounds and we supply um, all the major chains right across Canada. So it's a good place to sell honey. So today in this talk, I kind of want to kind of step you through my honey farm, just kind of walk you through and just kind of bring you a management perspective of a Canadian prairie beekeeper. <clears throat> so I have all my bees inside right now. A lot of guys uh, winter their hives inside. Not everybody, we have guys that winter outdoors also. But generally we bring them in uh, just to get them out of that cold, cold winter. It, primarily that wind. That wind is really tough on hives. As long as, you know, these outdoor hives, you wrap them up, you get them covered in snow, it, they winter really well, but we're just losing more and more bee yards. So it's, it's a lot easier to move our hives inside into a climate controlled building. I have 1500, it, I kind of double this winter room as my hot room too. So I move them all inside, stack them up six high to the ceiling and turn off the lights. And I keep this room about, you know, four degrees Celsius in there lights out, the hives stay nice and tight in their boxes and keep them in there till about March. Move them in November and we take them out end of March. So as spring approaches, uh, the indoor temperatures start to increase because I can't regulate the, uh, the indoor temperature uh, with the incoming air coming in. So the, the bees start to get anxious. And just like any of us, when we're going through a long, cold winter, we, we smell that fresh spirit of spring and we just want to get outside, right? Like our kids, they just want to get outside. Same with the bees, they can smell that, that spirit, that freshness, and they want to get outside. So they usually tell you when they want to get out and right here you can kind of see they're bearding. They're starting to get anxious, they want to get out. So I got to be very careful not to leave them inside for too long, for too warm, because they'll start bearding out and they'll start flying out, just get higher attrition that way. So we try to move them out when spring approaches. And I do everything with forklifts and pallets. I don't lift boxes anymore. I don't lift, so everything's on pallets and bee trucks and such. And I try to move my hives out at night. And one of the reasons for that is, well, they've been cooped up inside for about five months and they see that light and they want to fly, right? So by moving them out at night, I can keep them tucked away in their box, settle them down into their yards, and, uh, and then they can wait for they can wait for morning to take their first flight. The other reason why I do it is because as spring approaches, it gets really muddy. So as the night falls on us, the frost will sit back down into the, the ground and I can walk in frost. I'm not always getting stuck all the time. <clears throat> so the first flight, once we get them all out, the bees are able to get out and do their cleansing flight. So you gotta appreciate that these guys have been inside that winter shed 
for five months in confinement. And we set him out. This is just this video I wanted to show you here. This is one particular year. It was too wet. I couldn't access my spring yards. So I usually have like five or six different yards I put 200 hives down into. But uh, this, I couldn't get to those yards, so I had to put them all down into this gravel pit. So I have 1,500 hives set down into this gravel pit here. And there are literally hundreds of thousands of bees up in the air taking their first flight. And there is bee poop everywhere. It's, it's like a literal shit storm going on <laughs> within this colony. Right? That's, that's a bit of the cowboy coming out of me, but it is just an awe-inspiring um, spectacle that goes on at this point in time. So they get out and it takes them about two or three days to actually relieve themselves to get all the poop out of their guts as they're taking that flight. So we actually, we had to leave them alone because it's just too messy. So we, we set them down, we let them fly for a couple days before we can start our work. So we go through and we're assessing with feed. We're going through for emergency feed. They've been inside for five months. So we've got to target those big ones that are on the verge of starvation and uh, got to get some food onto them. So that's the first job. <coughs> this graph, I just love this. It's come from Randy Oliver. I, I know you guys had him out here last year. He's put this together with a data set uh, from a fellow back in Manitoba called Lloyd Harris and what he what Lloyd did as he went through the colony and he counted the brood and every 12 days he counted the bees that were emerging within the hive and every 12 days he'd count the painted bees and then he'd paint new ones it's just an incredible task and with that huge data set Randy, Randy took and did what Randy does best he puts it into a graph which makes a lot of sense I can just look at this for hours on then because it tells you everything that's going on it tells you the size of your hive it tells you your brood line that's going on within your colony throughout the year and it's telling you how old those bees are within the within the year so I'm moving the colonies out right here right at the end of March. So you can kind of notice once these guys set up their nest, that, that nest pr stays pretty static in size. As these bees get older, and as the older ones die off, they rear some new brood. So they keep that hive maintained just perfectly through until I set them out here. And right at this time, we're going around to supplemental feeding. So I got some dry feed out for them. This is before the trees come out and bloom. So I just want to energize that nest with protein you know, I'm putting patties down, so I just want to jolt that nest of protein just to excite that queen, just to, you know, convince those bees to start actively laying like a lot of bees. And I'm stimulating with uh, some feeding. So here I'm open feeding. I don't have too many neighbors around me, which is nice, so I can participate in open feeding, which is very, very natural way of feeding bees. Any, any, high, any beekeepers around me, I have to, you know, put pails out on the colonies. But I just want to energize that nest. I just want to get that queen going before those trees come out. So my first apiary assessment, I'm going through, I'm tipping back these colonies and just grab them, tip them back. And basically what I'm doing is I'm just trying to figure out the colonies that are needing feed, like right now, these colonies that, that are going on starvation. At the same time I'm doing that, I'm going through and I'm providing an apiary assessment. Okay. I do a lot of measurements on the growth of my colonies. And one way, and the reason why I do that is so I can track uh, my queens. I have too many colonies. I can't dig down into every colony. I can't figure out what she's doing in there without assessing them. So what I do is I, I progressively measure the growth of the colony throughout the spring to, to help tell me what's going on inside that nest. So as I'm going through, through the emergency assessments, I'm emergency feeding, I'm going through assessments. The strong ones I mark with blue, the eight to 10 framers, I call them box of bees. And the, uh, the medium ones, I mark them with a gray tag. These are mediums here. And the weak ones I mark like with a red tag, it's just so I get a little bit more attention. And I always assess my colonies from underneath because a beehive can't lie to you underneath. You pop a lid, you look down, those bees are coming up. They'll, they'll show you eight frames of bees up on top. This is a great hive. But you tip them back, and I'm counting, let's say, one, two, three, four frames of bees, bees here. They're stretching down, right? So this is the defined nest here. They won't lie to you underneath. 
It's just a more accurate way to measure your bees. So we're going through, we're feeding, we're assessing, we're calling out the dead ones, we're monitoring for disease, and we treat accordingly. <clears throat> so as I was saying, the colony assessments are a quick way to determine our queen vigor and a quick way to monitor your apiary to, to promote those strong hives and then target those failing ones. And it's just a way that we can also act to um, uh, act on those failing hives to salvage them before, you know, before they either die off or these failing hives, they just cost you money. So I'm going through in the spring, and my first assembly, so we're looking through two colonies here, just for an example. This is a nine frame winter colony with a vigorous queen and a nine frame colony with a failed queen. <clears throat> and the two lines that you want to pay attention are the brood line here and then the bee population. Forget about all this other information here. It's not important right now. So the first assessment we're coming through and the colony set themselves up just brilliantly through the, the winter. Good queens built this terrific winter nest. So they sail through winter. They're doing very well. They assess quite the same. But through the spring, that colony on this side is failing for whatever reason. It just give up. It's failing. So it's not throw, throwing the same brood nest out. So on my second assessment, about a month later, you start to see a lag. So this one's progressing, this one's just staying stagnant. Through this assessment, it's a hard, hard time to be able to pick out that colony as it's failing. If you can, you can figure that out. You put a new queen in there and you'll say, I will salvage that colony. The third assessment during my spring split, this is where you catch them. This one's giving me a full split. It's making me a lot of money. I'm gonna send this into the honey flow and produce a lot of honey. This one, it's not giving me a split, it's staying stagnant. And if we don't act on this guy, they're not only gonna, they're not gonna produce us honey, but they're not, we're gonna dump a pile of inputs into these guys, they're actually gonna cost us. So we wanna be able to target those colonies and pull them out of our apiary and put something in that spot that's gonna make us money, right? So we target these colonies and we take them back. We can either requeen them, if you buy a queen, you requeen them, or you can sell, salvage them into nukes. And that's what I typically do. I'll talk more about that in my uh, queen rearing uh, presentation. But you take these nukes, you, you take these colonies, you dump them into nukes, you take them right to the beginning and throw a queen cell just to rejuvenate that nest and get that colony making money again. <clears throat> so as we're calling out the equipment, it's very important that we're going through and we, we scrape and clean up everything. All the frames get scraped up, um, visually inspecting for disease, that's my job. I'm training Carrie, she's working on the farm, she's been here for quite a while, so she can identify some of the, the brood diseases and the, the dead comb now. So we're always looking for disease and we're always calling out if we find anything like that. <clears throat> we're sorting into piles. So we scrape up, clean up all this equipment, make it look pretty again, we, and we put them into piles that are empty, uh, piles of empty, piles of pollen, and piles of honey. And that just tells me how much comb resource I have available at hand. <clears throat> <clears throat> and we take that comb and we're sorting them into, I call them my split boxes. So we take the honey and we take the pollen and we take the empties and we all sort them into these boxes being ready to put on top of our singles that are just exploding in growth to be able to grow up and into. So I, I set these boxes up very specifically, very intentionally. I put uh, two foundation on the outside. So two foundation here, two foundation here. I put a honey frame, and then the four center ones are pollen and empty frames, okay? So it's very important. There's two foundation each side, two honey, the two honeys for the food, and then the pollen and the empty are, are the in the, on the inside. <coughs> so we're setting our hives out, end of March. Right here is an important time for that beehive. It's what I call like that that flip, that's, that uh, the nest flips from the winter nest into the spring nest, right? Taking all those old winter bees, rejuvenating that, rejuvenating that nest into a young, thriving uh, spring nest. <clears throat> and then they go into expansion mode. So right in this point of time, these long-lived bees are sailing through winter. We set them outside and they instantly turn into summer live bees. They instantly, and now they only have three or four weeks to live, and they dedicate all their time 
and resources on building that colony to be able to develop that brood out before they die off. It's, like the, it's almost like they pass on a piece of them to their brood nest. And by doing that, that time clock starts just like that. They're, they're making that spring nest. An extremely important point of time. So once they flip over, they get into that expansion mode. You can see this, this hive is growing exponentially. That brood nest is almost straight up. Look at the population. It's just booming in growth. So this is my first assessment. This is my second assessment. And so we're going through and we're tipping back these colonies again just to observe what's going on within the apiary. So uh, I'm tipping back these colonies and as they're marking blues, these boxes of bees, I'm looking at these huge hives. These guys instantly get a second, right? Those split boxes I made up earlier, we slap a second on them just like right there. So these big boxes of bees. Those mediums, we tip back, we're looking for progression. We're looking for if they're, you know, maybe they've de developed into a box of bees and we're gonna promote them. But if not, we just leave them in singles. We're going to go back through and we'll equalize all those mediums, take, give and take some brood back and forth, inspect that brood nest. Why are they not boxes of bees, you know? And all those weak ones, we go through and we, we, we try to salvage everything we can. We just inspect to see what's the reason why it's only three frames. A small colony doesn't necessarily mean a poor colony. A small colony just means there are circumstances that have resulted in it being small. So if it's small, it could thrive itself into a, a big money maker. So we got to be able to identify the ones that are failing and the ones that are, um, we got to identify the ones that are failing and identify the ones that are, are going to produce for you. It's through our assessments. <clears throat> so through the spring, up in Manitoba, it's cold all the time. And we're managing cold variable spring conditions. And once these hives get up into the trees and start brooding. I keep them tight. I keep them tight in my boxes. It's just like I think a lot of you would recognize hives that are kept in smaller spaces just seem to thrive. They just seem to do better. So I do that for my entire apiary. I keep them as tight as I can. I, I have them utilize pretty much all the space within that brood nest. I'm not worried about swarming because this is this point of time when they're, you know, they're flipping their nest into that spring nest. They're focused on just rejuvenating that nest. So I make sure they use all that space and I keep them tight. I give them, they, they have the honey, they have, I'm feeding them at the same time. They have all the resources they need. They're bringing this pole and they, they lay out these massive frames of, of brood. They're about to hatch. And I think the, uh, I think it's like one frame of brood to three frames of bees. When, when that emerges, it's going to turn into three frames of bees. So on the second assessment, I'm walking the line on to when those frames are going to hatch. And I have to make sure I have space available. But I'm very, very specific when I put my extra space on. If it's cold and snowy and just terrible conditions and I slap a second box up on top, I just completely change the dynamics of that colony within that nest and it kind of, sh it'll shock them if it's cold and they just kind of sit back and it just adds stress. And I've, I've, the years that I've put space on top and it's too cold, add stress, they'll be kicking chalk brood, <clears throat> chalk brood out that front for the next three weeks. It's just like, ah. So last year was a cold spring. I'm going through, these colonies are big, they need space, but it's cold, I can't put it on top. So a trick that you can do is you can put that space underneath. So it just gives a place for those bees to hatch out and give them a place to live without, you know, turning into swarm preparation. And I'm, I'm pacing because I don't want to do that because it's a hell of a lot of work. And my employees don't want to do that because they know they're going to be the ones doing the work. <laughs> so we're pacing and pacing and finally the weather turned and we put all the space on top and they just beautifully moved up into the space on top. When we do add the space underneath, we have to come back when the weather warms and put that space on top because that colony is moving upwards. You're not gonna prevent that colony from swarming by her moving down. You're gonna prevent it by her moving up. She wants to move up, we gotta promote that. So let's say the warm weather comes and these boxes are busting full of bees and I'm putting space up on top. So I throw my uh, split boxes on top of these boxes of bees and like I was saying, we have foundation, honey, empty, 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 honey, foundation, foundation. And I'm promoting that upward movement of that queen. 
and I'm telling her exactly what I want her to do. I want to, I want to take a full split off these big colonies, and that's going to be about four frames of brood. And I'm telling her what to do, so I give her four frames empty space right in the center, right? So she's going to pretty much stovepipe up into that second box. She's going to lay out that box of brood for me, move back down, and then all i got to do is take that split away. <clears throat> The reason why I put the foundation on the outside is because inevitably I'm falling behind in my work, whether it's because I have too many hives or it's because the weather falls down on me or whatever reason. And when you have a big colony like this, it's got like five or six frames of brood down here and let's say she's laid you out four frames of brood up there and you get behind by a week and a half or whatever and they all hatch out on you. You got all these young bees inside this nest and then they go hit the dandelions and bring in this, all this resource they're gonna swarm off on you. So what I, with this foundation on the side, it just is a place to buy me time. It's just a place for these bees to drop all that energy and to keep their mind off swarming and just keep putting it towards developing out that nest. So usually by the beginning of my split, as I'm taking these boxes away, these foundations are hardly even touched. Midway through, they're just nicely getting on there. These center frames are just beautiful cap frames of of splits, of, of frames of brood. By the end of my split, you guys have these packed full of honey yet. I'm like, holy crap, this is, I'm walking the line. But that's why I do that. <clears throat> so May and June in my area is what I would consider my um, swarm season. They've come out of spring. This is a rep reproductive stage. And you just see the growth in here. Just absolutely tremendous. So right about end of May into June, that's when I target for my split. <clears throat> so the split on my farm, you'd think the honey flow is the busiest, most stressful time, but the split is probably the busiest, most stressful time on my honey farm anyways. Uh, if you work these hives too early, you just shock them and move them backwards. And if you split them too late, you're just, they're going to swarm off and you live in the trees. Uh, so my objective is to promote continual growth of these colonies as we harvest all these extra bees uh, all the way through the spring. I just want to continually grow these colonies out. <clears throat> and when I first started my beekeeping business, I, you know, I used to split my colonies. You used to go down and find the queen and then take the split away. It's a hell of a lot of work. I just... And I, I changed that. I, I remember a time very specifically, very vividly. I'm working through my colonies. I got to make my splits. These colonies are exploding. I have, like I've already did 200 colonies at that time. I have another 200 ahead of me. I'm going through, I have 200 queens sitting on my desk at home in the honey house waiting to be used. Dad's off to Winnipeg to pick up another 200 queens from Be Made to participate to my split. And I'm working through this colony. I can't find the queen go through all 20 frames, can't find her, so I go through it again, finally find her, make the split, and it's not working. I'm looking at the forecast, and it's like three or four days ahead of me of cold weather. I'm not going to get my work done. I'm going to have all these queens sitting on my desk, all this investment, all these hives ahead of me that I can't split because, of the, because it's taking me too much time to find that queen to get through. And I get into the next colony. Sure enough, I can't find that queen. So I go through another 20 frames and I finally find the queen. I make my split and I remember leaving the yard. I texted my buddy at that time. He had 1,200 colonies and I said, how are you doing this? How are you splitting your colonies? How are you getting all this work done? And he said, well, you're spending too much time on your hives. And I just about texted back. I said, no, no, no shit, Sherlock. <laughs> <laughs> so I left and I went to the next yard. It's in the evening and... I figured, well, I'll get, try to get one more hive done. So I dive into that yard, dive in, I can't find that damn queen again. So I close up the colony, I start driving home. I text my buddy again, I said, no, how, how are you managing all this work? And he, he told me, he texted back, he said, well, quit finding the queen. And I said, what the hell does he talk about? I don't understand, what, um, I, don't, I didn't know what he meant. So I drove home, thinking about this the entire time. Got home, jumped in the shower. And the shower, I don't know about you, but the shower is where I do all my thinking. It's where I reflect on the day. I stand there in the hot water. It's terrible for the hot water bill. <laughs> but I just stand and reflect on the day and think about thoughts and stuff. And it kind of come to me. I said, of course, quit finding the queen. Why am I spending all my time searching for the queen when I should be splitting that colony off? 
so with that, I put together kind of like a, a program or a process to kind of manage it, split, without spending so much bloody time finding that queen. And I'll try to walk you through this process just to show you how I put it together. So I take the colony, so we've got a colony here, and she's got two boxes full of brood. And we want to take that top box away as a split. Okay, so what I do is I take the top box, I put it up on top of the colony beside it, put it on the inner cover so the bees can't boil at the bottom, right? I go down to that bottom box and I count out my frames. And for me, I want my hives four frames of brood. That's the strength I want my colonies, capped brood. I always assess my colonies on capped brood. So I go down and I count out my four frames of brood. I put this funnel on, on top. Everybody wonders what the hell that is. It's like a, it's an old laundry tub I bought at Walmart. I cut the bottom out, made a frame. So it's a funnel, this funnel is what it is. Because what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna take all these bees from the top, and I'm gonna shake them down to the bottom. I used to use an old box shell, but you know, this is, is a little bit taller, and it's easier to shake into. So it's just a funnel, so I, frame by frame, I shake all the bees down to the bottom box, put them in the box beside, and then when this is all shaken down, I put this queen excluder over top of that bottom box. That second box goes back on top, and those bees will naturally migrate through that queen excluder, right? And I know that queen's going to be down there because I shook every single bee down into that bottom box. I then come around in a couple hours, or usually that evening, or sometimes if I see nasty weather ahead and I got to get a lot of work done, we focus all our time on setting up the split, and then we can come around through the cool weather to take the split. So all we do is we basically strip off all those splits because we know that queen's down there. We've settled out the brood frames. We're taking these top boxes and we're just taking them. This is an easy loader here. I just throw pallets down in the yard and I get the guys just to simply take these boxes, put it on the pallet, lift it onto the truck and out to the mating yard. <clears throat> and then I take these queen excluders off and I put a honey box on top. Okay. And the reason why I do that is because I want to continue that queen. I want to, I'll just back up. We're right in the middle of the swarm season. We're taking a split. And that queen's still laying, upward laying in her brood laying. We have all this swarm season we got to deal with. So I want to provide that queen with as much space as she wants during that time uh, without swarming off on me. Because I want to I want to control that population so they don't swarm, but I want to maximize the bees in that box to be able to have those bees to bring this monster crop that's about to come in. <clears throat> so if we're not simply stripping the boxes off, taking the split, we're making nukes. So here's Carrie, she's my uh, right hand beekeeper. Uh, she's coming through the top and she's taking, she's making up a bunch of nukes. So it's two brood frames and a honey frame and foundation and whatever. So we're just stripping all the surplus strength off and we're just making a shit ton of nukes. And we set them down into our mating yards. Or we buy imported queens. You can put a mated queen in there. That's no problem. I've switched more to a self-sustainable queen management program where I do all my queen rearing in house now. So we'll drop a queen cell into each and every one of those splits and colonies. I'll be talking about this later this afternoon if you're interested. <coughs> so the split's done. That bottom box is all settled out. The whole apiary is the same size. I have honey boxes up on top. That queen's going up there. She's, she's happy. She has all the space she needs within that nest. And they're pretty much set up, ready for the main flow. So all that stress, all that work is done. <clears throat> the alfalfas, the clovers, um, are providing nourishment to my colonies at that time. So they're growing, they're really happy. There's a little bit of downtime for me because all this work is done, they're set up. We're just, now we're just moving our yards out to the summer yards to collect honey. And everything's great. Until canola comes. Canola is our main flow. Everything back in Manitoba, everything in the Canadian prairies actually revolves around canola. This is our money maker. So 
So as soon as the canola starts to bloom, it just so happens it starts blooming at the end of my swarming season. So right here at the end of the swarming season, right at this time you notice the brood nest has pretty much achieved all she can do. It's leveled right out. And a mass of bees in those boxes. So right at this time we're shaking these bees, shaking the queens, we're moving every, the queen from the top box, she's down there, down to the bottom, and we're putting excluders in. And I basically do it the same way. I take the split, we just come through the whole apiary, and we just basically shake all those bees from the top box down into the bottom box, and we put a queen excluder in. And then we put, instead of taking that as a split, we just put that back on top for that nest to hatch out. <clears throat> so right at this time, it's the end of June, going into July, school's out, and I have all these kids in town that are looking for a job, so they come up to the farm, they want a job, so I throw them, you know, a bee suit, some gloves, I say, okay guys, let's go shake some bees. <laughs> and it's really nice because even my daughter, she's, I had my daughter work for me last year, and my oldest son wants to work for me this year, and it is because of these cell phones, because we're not gonna pay for the, 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 <laughs> for the, uh, the program for these cell phones, and none of the parents are going to pay for it either, so all these kids got to find a way to make money. So they, they're looking for a job, and it's absolutely brilliant. And the best thing about beekeeping is kids can't be on a phone with their gloves on. <laughs> <laughs> so I get the best of both worlds here. <laughs> so anyways, these kids come, and, you know, they're capable. They can sure enough shake bees from a frame. So I set the yard up. We're shaking the bees down. We're putting excluders in. When we get behind I maybe put fume boards just to help drive them down, quicken the process up. So this is, uh, gets really busy. So the whole apiary is busting with bees, canola flow is coming. As soon as that canola flows, just like that, these boxes instantly fill up with honey. It's like we got to get these queens down to the bottom box right now and give these hives more space. Because if we're too laggy, we're going to be shaking heavy frames of nectar and there'll be nectar shaking down on the bottom and these frames are heavy, the kids' arms will get tired. And we got to get space on top because that second box is going to fill up and we got to get space on top for them to fill up. So we shake all the bees down, we put the queen excluder in, we put those boxes back on top, and then we drop a third on immediately right away. <clears throat> so right at this time, after that queen's down here, queen excluder's in, that brood in the second box, it's going to hatch out. It's going to hatch out. It, they don't hatch. I always say hatch. The eggs hatch, the bees emerge. <laughs> but uh, the bees will emerge from those frames and then the colony is going to backfill that nest with nectar. So I've been just working from April, 15, 18, 18 hour days, long hours, trying to keep ahead of the split, trying all this work to manage. I'm tired, you know. That's when I go to the lake. A little bit of family time because right about this time I have this crew of kids coming in to help me with my work of all these kids and we need to add space on top I don't have to be there for that I, it doesn't take a genius to take a box and put it on top of a colony so I leave I'm gonna leave for a week I tell my crew I'm gone for a week I want you guys to add fourths and fifths onto every hive within this apiary I want you to mow every yard, because I don't want to mow a yard, so I get my kids to do that. Uh, and if it's raining, they're going to be building frames, or sorting foundation, all these jobs. I just have this list full of jobs, I don't have to be there. And it just allows me to get away and just take a breath, just a little bit of a breather, just a little bit of reprieve from these bees. Because the, these, these hives are, I don't know about you guys, but every one of my bees have a little wee whip and they just keep whipping me to keep me working all the time. <laughs> I got to get away from that and that's the only way I can keep going in this business. So I do that by going to the lake and it is ever nice. And when I get back we get busy. So after we put the queen excluders in, after we shake that queen down to the bottom, <clears throat> we got to wait for at least 21 days because that box has to hatch out, you know, at least 21 days to allow that brood to emerge before we start harvesting. We don't want to bring that brood into the honey house. And I stage my apiary um, according to my capability of workload. So I have 1,500 hives. My facility is capable of extracting 500 hives a week. 
So I stage my apiary into threes. So the first 500 hives I focus, I keep them tight. So I have them stacked up. They need more space, but I'm gonna be at them right away to take the honey to give them more space. <clears throat> so I'm very um, conservative in the space I gave them. Uh, the hives, that'll take a week before I get to them, I add a box on. I have a box a week rule. These hives will fill a box in a week. So anything, the next week we're going through assessing if they're filled up, we give them another box on, sp on top for space. Those ones stuck right on the end, you know, on that third time, or third week I'll get to them, I, I'll be really liberal with those guys and I'll give a lot of those guys two boxes of space. Just trying to keep ahead of that flow, just trying to gather absolutely every little bit of that nectar coming in to make sure they have space to start within the colonies. <clears throat> So when we're going around, we're pulling honey. These boxes, you know, they can weigh up to 80 pounds each. It gets really heavy. That's a lot of work. So what we do is we employ a method of pulling honey where we don't actually physically have to lift these boxes. And I bought an easy loader. And I remember a time back when we were pulling honey, we used to pull the boxes off. We either drive them down with fumes or we'd blow them out with blowers. And it was a really heavy year really good honey flow and again I was standing in my shower thinking to myself I'm tired my back is sore heavy flow how am I going to keep doing this work and sustain myself sustain my health without hurting myself you know without relying on my employees to come in to do all this treacherous work lifting these heavy boxes and I'm standing there I have everything on pallets I do everything with skidsters and everything but it didn't relieve that awkward act of physically lifting those boxes off the hive like how the hell do you do that so i was standing in the shower thinking to myself and, and it dawned to me of, well why don't we employ a lift and then these nifty little escape boards so what we do is we come around and we lift up our heavy boxes so this is one of my guys here he's lifting up boxes of they just simply lift the stack we slap in two empties and then we put in the escape board and we put these boxes back on top and what's going on is these bees are naturally cycling within their nest like this. They're always moving up and down, whether or not they're coming down and meet that queen because they want to gather some of that substance. But more importantly, these processor bees are cycling up and down because they're going to meet the forager bee to, as the forager bee drops their payload to the processor bees to come up and store just so they can get it back out in the yard and get some more nectar. It's more efficient this way. So these bees are cycling, continuously, continuously cycling. So we come through, <clears throat> we lift up these boxes, we slap in this uh, bee escape, put them back up on top. Foragers come in, drop the load to, the, to these processor bees, they migrate down, get the payload, and they can't get back up here because they can't get through this screen. Um, for some reason, they can get down through the cones, but they can't get themselves back up. So they migrate themselves down through the screen, they get the payload, and then they just carry on their work like nothing's happened, filling these empty boxes down the bottom here. So we leave these uh, escapes on for about three days, two days, three days. By that time, all the bees have migrated down, come through with their crew, and with the loader again, we just simply come and we just strip off the entire yard, take all these boxes full of honey without bees in them, load them onto the truck. The guys just work all day swinging this arm back and forth. And we bring the boxes back to the honey house. Everything's on pallets. Drop them into my hot room. My hot room is, I keep it about 30 degrees Celsius. Warm honey flows, as you know, warm honey flows at a comb. So I want to warm that honey up. I have floor heat, a heated cement pad so that warmth just travels from the floor up and just warms absolutely every little bit of honey in these boxes. And I let them sit in here for about two or three days because there's always stragglers come in. There's always these annoying bees that are just lingering in these boxes and they get attracted to that window just like a magnet. They go to that window and uh, we just gather them up, throw them in a little box, put another queen cell in there and make another colony. But <laughs> it just works beautifully. <laughs> But this hot room, I have about 2,000 boxes in here, and the guys just every day, I run the honey house every day, they just keep pulling from one side of the room, I keep adding to the other side, and it just runs in a cycle. 
There's some of you, you guys have small hive beetle here. We don't have, have small hive beetles, too cold up in Canada, which allows me to be able to stockpile a bunch of supers like this. So I run a 60 frame count extractor and a Cooks and Beals wax separator. So I run about three or four kids in here. Every day, every day they're pulling out uh, 275 or 350 boxes of honey, depending on how heavy the boxes are. So we're, we're pulling out probably 18 to 22 drums a day. And I'm in the yards every day where I need to be. I'm, I'm in the yards, that's where I make the money. So I bring two, sometimes I bring three, just depending on how many guys show up to work. <laughs> but uh, two or three guys come out with me. I have two or three guys in the honey house. And our honey flow starts July and it typically runs right to September. It's starting to run shorter now. We're starting to run out of flow at the beginning of August now. Last year is beginning of August. We just seemed to lose that last half of our honey flow. But on a good year, it runs to September. And yeah, I'm producing roughly 450 drums of honey. So I'll just quickly go through this. At the end of the season, we're stripping off all the boxes and we use the escapes. We push them all down to the bottom box again. And they get pretty tight down there. <clears throat> and you have to appreciate that these boxes the queen, instead of making her nest like this between the two, she's down in that bottom box now, and she, she pretty much uses that entire box to fill full of brood. So I'm, I'm pulling out frames, I'm pulling like eight or nine frames of brood down in the bottom box. And you can appreciate that leaves absolutely no space for food. So we have to be very careful that when we're pulling off these honey boxes, we don't pull off, we don't send them into starvation. So you see the double has lots of resource available, they're nice and happy. On a single box, we have the excluder that holds that queen down and pushes all that honey up. And it's brilliant because then I can take all that honey away to harvest and then I just come back and provide them food. So I got to make sure that once I take away their food, that I give them syrup back to feed on. These are my, uh, my nukes. And it's even more exaggerated when I confine them to six frames instead of ten. And there, there is absolutely no food down there for that queen. So I take those boxes away. I got to be pretty smart to get that honey or syrup back on them. I do it with open feeding, and I do it with pale feeding. And as soon as those boxes are stripped off, I'm I'm putting feed out just to give them enough to be able to sustain themselves. I'm not bulking them up at this time. I'm just trying to. Um, provide them the food to allow them to continue to de develop out that nest. And I'm also doing that with, whoops. I'm also doing that with patties. So I'm feeding them, just give them a jolt of protein just to help complement that natural stuff coming in. I'm not trying to replace that pollen coming in, I'm just trying to complement and provide everything they need to be able to develop out that nest. <coughs> so we're feeding and we're focusing on treatments at this time also. I'll just skip through this. So we're right back at the end of the season. We take the honey boxes off and we're preparing that nest for winter. And as you can appreciate, that queen is decreasing her egg laying. She pretty much gives up all the space within that box. And I take advantage of that by bulking that nest up with syrup. So as that queen finishes out the year, her bees are, are are whipped to the seasons up in Canada for us anyways. They're very defined. So as they move from summer into fall, she starts decreasing her egg laying as she sets up that winter nest, right? Or as, as the bees, I guess, set up that winter nest. And as, that, as she gives up that space, I'm following behind with syrup. And I'm in about September is when I focus on bulk feeding and plugging that nest out with syrup to help them shut down. So I'm weighing all these colonies. Uh, my target is about 95 pounds per single, and that'll get my hives till April. <clears throat> so I pack these guys right full. Before I bring them inside, I've started giving them a shot of oxalic acid. These hives are naturally going broodless, and those mites can't hide on you anymore. So I control my mites in the spring with Apivar, so Amitraz, and it gets me till fall. And then I, once those bees are exposed, they can't hide. I give them a shot of oxalic and it just wipes them all out. But you can't have any brood. If you do it too soon, if there's brood in this colony, you're, you're going to miss a lot of mites. So you, you got for this to work, it's got to be a broodless nest. So after all that work's done, I go around with my easy loader, pick up all my colonies, 
put them onto my truck. And I like to do this when it's not snowing because when it snows, it makes a hell of a lot more work. <laughs> You're just dealing with snow and slippery pallets and boxes and pallets frozen to the ground. It's just another layer of work. So I try to get it done before it snows. It doesn't always happen. Use my forklift, stack them up into the shed, and I close the door and I turn out the lights. And that is, and that brings me to the end of a year <laughs> perspective in a, a prairie beekeeping operation. Thank you. <laughs> Do I have time for a question maybe? Three questions. I take a question right in the front here. Are all my boxes? All my boxes are standard. Yeah, they're all standard, um, ten frame deep. Yeah, yeah, everything is standardized. So that way, it just allows me to be able to rotate comb. So as a brood nest, I rotate out the comb. If I'm not giving them foundation frames, I'm pulling from the honey boxes to provide them some comb. So it just helps keep everything the same. You keep everything the same. It just makes operations so much simpler. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, sir. How many sections of land do my bees have access to for canola? Um, so my apiary is uh, roughly, it's kind of nice. Like we've been farming in the area for quite a while. We're just about a hundred year farm now. And so we know our neighbors quite well. My apiary is nice and tight. It's 200 square miles is what my apiary is. And there's canola all through that. So I'd say about a third to half of that would be a canola field. So when, <clears throat> there's a, I don't have a picture here, but during the canola bloom, you look across the countryside, and as far as you can see is yellow flowers. And it's just amazing. So these bees will fly. I'm always counting a mile away from that colony to collect that crop. They'll fly a mile and a half, easy enough too, if they want to. So I'm looking within that two mile radius for that. And I try to keep my hives, my apiaries on a grid like almost like a mile and a half from each other. So I like to keep myself beekeeper to beekeeper. We like to be two miles away from each other just to help decrease interaction between the two yards. But with my apiary, I, I take it down to a mile in some places spaced yards of 40. Yeah. Um, yes, sir, in the blue. Yeah, the question is wax moths. <clears throat> so our wax moths fly up from the southern states, and they, <laughs> thank you, <laughs> they, uh, they generally don't arrive until August, they may be there in July, so if I have dead oats, I have maybe a year, I had a bad year of dead oats, I have a pile of brood boxes sitting in the corner in my, in my uh, shop, by come August you'll start seeing wax moths within those brood combs. As for the honeycombs, it's not so bad because we're cycling the bees room all the time. So it keeps them fresh. We put them in storage in September, <clears throat> in September, and by the time the wax moth actually gets there to do any damage, we're into October when it gets cold, and cold weather kills every stage of wax moth. So my wax moth control is keeping bees in the boxes and, and cycling it, and winter is my other. If I have this uh, big stack of brood comb, in my shop and I don't know what to do and the wax moth is getting in there. I have a reefer trailer where I store my boxes and I'll, and during the honey flow it's empty because all the boxes are in the yard. I put these brood boxes in the reefer trailer and turn it on, it's minus 20 and it freezes all those little pricks. And it's just, it, that's how I deal with those guys. <laughs> Excuse my language. <laughs> uh, the question is what's my normal winter loss <clears throat> and that's, um, year to year. Uh, typically I'm looking, I'm expecting a 10%, 15%. I'm missing colonies, drone layers. There's, there's issues that go on that have happened. So about that, I've had up to 35% loss, 40% loss because of the mite, specifically to the Varroa mite. Since I started rotating oxalic acid into my treatment regime, uh, my, my losses have been a lot more predictable at, um, at 10%. I'll have another 10 or 15% through the summer that I call out, if you know what I mean. But just winter loss is about 10 or 12%. Yeah. <clears throat> and I find with my, now, I, now that I um, 
make my own queens. Now that I have this ability to identify these poor colonies and call them out before they collapse, I can salvage them by dropping a queen cell in them and just continue to refresh. So I pull those colonies that are failing and put a new colony in there. The continual refresh and regeneration of my colonies just seems to help overall with my, my colony attrition, my apiary attrition, <clears throat> just continually refreshing those queens. Yes, one more at the back there. Yeah, so the question is, with the splits I make, I make them into my, my nukes, <clears throat> and whether or not I leave them in my nukes for the full year and winter them that way, and I do, and I'll talk about that in my queen rearing, rearing program. Uh, I forget, right after lunch, I think I'm talking, 115 about that. I talk very specifically about that, but I do. I keep them in my nukes, and I manage them in the nukes uh, through the summer as multi-queen units where it can produce this big honey crop off them too and then keep them nice and tight so I'm not wasting the um, you know, those big expansive brood nest from those queens when they're not gonna give me any production. So I keep them tight and I winter them through and then I transfer them into singles the following year. But I'll talk specifically about that in my next speak. Okay, uh, thank you very much for your attention.